I'm Shelley Palmer. I'm Ross Martin. And you're listening to Think About This. Today, staying connected to your customers and clients during the crisis. We've got answers from Rachel Tipograph, founder and CEO of Micmac. And we've got Gina Bianchini, who's the founder of Mighty Networks. So welcome to Think About This. The more you listen, the less you know. So everybody knows that Rachel's on all the lists, 30 under 30 who are changing the world from Forbes. Marie Claire named her one of the 50 most influential women in America. Fast Company called her one of the most creative people in business. Ad Age, same thing, most creative people of the year. Ad Week, everybody. I mean, 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs from Business Insider, The Wrap, LinkedIn. I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. One of her big jobs was that she was the global director of digital and social media at Gap, bringing Gap actually into the 21st century, if you ask me. And that's where she oversaw strategy, implementation, and measurement. And she was very young. And when she stopped working at Gap, she took 100 days off, traveled the world, and then came back and founded Micmac. And everybody knows in the new economy, Micmac is best positioned to win from an e-commerce perspective. So with total respect and awe, welcome to the show, Rachel Tipograph. Thanks, Ross. I'm very lucky to have you as my cheerleader. <laughs> I am your cheerleader. I know. He's a, he's a good cheerleader. Shelly is too. I oh, know. absolutely. Shelly is too. Go, Rachel. Go, Rachel. Go, Rachel. No. Rachel, can you please tell everybody about, about Micmac so people understand what your company means for yeah. the new economy. Uh, so Micmac is an e-commerce marketing platform for multi-channel brands, meaning if the majority of your sales come from places like Amazon, Target, Walmart, Ulta, Sephora, Instacart, Kroger, Peapod, Drizzly, Reserve Bar, you will probably become my client because you live in darkness with e-retail data. So I'll give you an example. Take my client at L'Oreal. No matter where they're buying media on the internet, they send someone to a Sephora product detail page. The moment the customer clicks or swipes up, L'Oreal has now lost that customer. They have no insight into whether the customer purchased or not. They have no idea how to optimize that creative, optimize media to move someone down the path to purchase. So this is more relevant than ever before because in the last four weeks, e-commerce for so many consumer brands has now become their only sales channel. I think the most illuminating aspect has actually been in the liquor industry. If you talk to any of my liquor clients a month ago, they would have told you that 1% of their overall revenue came from e-commerce. Today, it's close to 100%. So overnight, consumer behavior has fundamentally changed. Wow. So Shelly and I have been talking a lot about what this pandemic means to small and mm -hmm. medium-sized businesses. So the SMB is out there. And as we speak, we're watching the horror show of hundreds of thousands of them uh, caught in this uh, extinction event and actually dying right before our eyes, which is a really, really hard thing to watch. Mm -hmm. What we're also seeing more broadly is the death of the old economy and the birth of the new economy. And there are some bright spots. There are some companies who are, are actually well positioned um, for the new consumer reality. Most of those have already found Micmac and are working with you. And then there's a, a new generation that are suddenly realizing th they need a company like Micmac to be able to survive in the reality of this new economy. Are you starting to see, you know, in this crisis, those SMBs turn to you and say, okay, Rachel and team at Micmac, ha like, help me figure out how to actually do business this way because before I didn't have to, but now it's my, as you say, it's my lifeline. It's, it's the only way for me to go. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't say it's just the SMBs. Like if you think about liquor, if you think about grocery, if you were operating under the old economy mindset where 97% of your sales were happening in brick and mortar, e-commerce might be something that you never even built out a foundation around. So Because you didn't have to. Right. So I would say, you know, this is, this is a strange thing for me to talk about because so many people are struggling who are you know, in my family, my friends, and my heart goes out to so many business owners right now. Um, 
Micmac has grown in ways the past four weeks that I didn't even think were possible. And that's because of the change in the customer journey. We're getting inquiries from the Fortune 1000 all the way down to the SMBs. Now, how they tackle these issues is very different based on their sheer size. You know, for example, like, you know, I work with the Unilevers of the world. The Unilevers are going to ensure that their products still get produced in factories. Like at the core, we're having supply chain fulfillment issues. SMBs don't have the same leverage as a Unilever. So their problems are often deeper than just e-commerce marketing. They're trying to figure out how do they keep producing their product when their suppliers are shutting down. So with all of that being said, um, for SMB business owners, I think the big question is, one, how do you put as much cash as possible on your balance sheet right now? Like that has to be at the forefront of everyone's mind. And then two, what are your alternative ways of producing products during a time when so many factories have shut down in China and in Italy? And I think those are the big questions that a lot of people are trying to answer. A lot of the organizations that we all deal with don't have the workflow and process in place to go to 100% D2C or e-commerce overnight. Because even if you had the supply, if you had a warehouse full of stuff, if you don't have a way to take that order, to track that that path to purchase and then you know really capitalize on it, you are a tremendous risk, far greater risk uh, than you, and, and you don't even know it. I 100% agree. Um, the key indicator for me is, you know, the last four weeks, I'm getting emails from C-suite asking me if our deal is done yet. And my reply has been, I've been working with your team for 11 months. No, the deal hasn't gotten done. Now the CEO or the CMO of these Fortune 1000 companies are pushing my deal through for everything that you just said. Yeah. Because they now finally understand that e-commerce is their responsibility. The scary thing is, is the other part that you were alluding to, which is that they don't have the staff to accomplish these things. So, I mean, one of the key things that we've been doing the last few weeks is increasing our training, trying to upskill traditional CPG marketers on performance marketing and e-com because all of a sudden this is now their job responsibility. This is what I mean by the birth of the new economy. Um, those position players have to learn a new position. And th the winners are athletes who uh, ha have the, the flexibility and the passion and the desire to learn a new set of skills so that they can immigrate to the the reality of the 21st century economy. And Micmac is at the forefront of it. And so what what I admire about you is you're acknowledging the awkwardness of running an enterprise that is finding great success in this moment, while all around us, the local, national, and global economy is collapsing. So that, that's a weird thing to be experiencing, but you're leaning into it. And what I mean by that is that you've opened yourself up. You're making the time to come on our podcast, which we are grateful for. And you're hosting a weekly seminar where it's more of like a, a weekly social event online. Can you tell us about that? Because you've become now not just the thought leader you've always been, you've become a pioneer for the new economy and you are bringing people along with you and helping them understand how to succeed, uh, not just inspiring them, but informing them on how to operate in this new reality. So what are you doing on Thursday afternoons that everybody needs to know about? I started this webinar series with my good friend and fellow founder, Anda Gonska, who's the CEO of Notch. And it started by just us calling each other and talking about A, the, the business challenges that we were trying to navigate as founders, and then B, the business challenges that we were hearing our clients trying to navigate. And we were like, why don't we just bring all these people together and try to host a virtual roundtable discussion? What we didn't think was going to happen was that thousands of people would sign up every single week. That's been really remarkable. It, it's clear that it's a topic that people uh, want to hear from others on, and that also people have time on their hands right now. Everyone's looking to consume content online. So we'll have 
a very diverse set of leaders explaining to us how they're navigating not just this crisis, but we're also going to be picking their brains around the 2000 crash and the 2008 stock market crash and what learnings did they take from that experience to help their organizations navigate today? And you, you've got thousands of people. I think the first one you did had a thousand people. Yeah, it's it's been wild. The world loves webinars right now. Yeah, like you guys should take this podcast into a webinar. Well, yeah, we do. I actually do uh, two a week now. We do the um, alone together discussion group on Wednesday afternoons for an hour from three to four. And then on, I do a work from home webinar Sundays from two to three. They're actually interactive discussions on Zoom. So it, it, you're right. People love it. We'll keep doing it as long as people need it. Um, it it's a time when, when he- helpful advice and how to seems to really matter. And to that end, for this podcast to be even more amazing than it generally is, because Ross is amazing and you're amazing and I'm just here as a cheerleader. Um, what, <laughs> what can people who are listening do right now? to up their e-commerce game or to get ready to do that, or if they have a lot of questions about the, the new world they're in, wh- what's the best way for them to, appro- other than hiring Micmac, and I'm sure that's the right thing for them to do, but if that's not possible right now, wh- what do you tell people to do to prepare themselves or to, to approach how to do this now? At the highest level, you need to make sure that your products are available where the demand is. So one is having a deep understanding of where people are indicating consumer demand for your type of products. Step two is making sure that you have inventory available. And if inventory is not available everywhere, then the critical thing that you need to fix in the customer journey is making sure that when the customer is seeking your type of product, that you can immediately direct them to where the product is in stock. And the reason why this is more critical than ever before is that if you spoke to me a month ago, I actually wouldn't say that's the most critical thing that you need to solve for. I would say the most critical thing that you need to solve for is giving the customer the power to choose where they want to check out. Meaning a month ago and every day prior, retailer preference was paramount. So if you were Sephora loyalist, you were never going to go shop at Ulta. It's totally different now. The things that customers care about is Is the product in stock? How fast can I get it? And they're even willing to do that at a higher price. So ensuring media that you have in market is directing people to where the product is in stock. And then finally, from a creative and messaging standpoint, like you really want to make sure that you're not tone deaf right now because that could have long-term damaging effects on your brand. So understanding what your creative is, where the messaging is at, and how that should be shaped by geography. Those are the things that we're constantly coaching our clients on, or even prospects, whether they're choosing to work with us or not. Rachel, what you're doing is inspiring, um, as I said, not just old folks like us, but a whole new generation of leaders, entrepreneurs, talented people who are going to emerge from this pandemic with uh, a new sense of what's possible, and a new set of values and a new way of working together. So we are grateful to you for coming on our show and for continuing to be the leader that you are. If anyone wants to learn more, how can they best reach you and how can they connect to the round table so that they can be part of it? So you can check us out, micmac, M-I-K-M-A-K dot TV, and you can find information about us and the round table there. And then my email is just my name, rachel at micmac.tv. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks, guys, for having me. Hey, Ross, do you know who Gina Bianchini is? Do you know who she is? Yeah, well, who doesn't? She's like legendary. But I don't know her as a friend like you do. And now I want to be friends with her. You definitely want to be friends with her. First of all, she's a genius. That's first of all. That's what they say. No, <laughs> she co-founded Ning with Mark Andreessen a while back. That was like the first social network that was like private that you could make your own version of. And that got to be like over 100 million people. And then she founded Mighty Networks. Now, you know, I started PGX a couple weeks ago and I was looking all through the universe for like, how can I get this thing up super fast yep. and make it super awesome and not get caught up in the tech. I just wanted to get the people together because, you know, there was a big reason to get people together and not such a big reason to get technology together. I think you went a max of 
24 to 36 hours from the moment you told me you were going to do this and then you did it. Like I don't, yeah. I've never yeah. seen anyone do that that fast. You, you actually created so thank you for your that. own social community in like about a day. And now there's like thousands <laughs> of people in it. Yeah. And I know you didn't do that shit on your own. No, I did not do that on my own. What I did was I went to, <laughs> went to Google and I Googled super awesome genius social networks in a box. And the first thing that came up- a long search. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a really long search. And the first thing that came up was no, it was was just basically a picture of Gina. Gina, how are you? <laughs> good. <laughs> that's a good intro. I love I mean, that. that's probably the best intro I've ever gotten. So thank you. Wow, I got to tell you, Gina, I, Ross is not kidding. Hyperbolistically, he's not being hyperbolistic. I talked to Ross about this. Hey, you know, I actually, I, I called him and I said, do you, do you think it's a good idea to do like a thing? And yeah, you did. Ross was like, yeah, it's a good idea. It was going to take you a long time. So yeah, yeah, no, it isn't. <laughs> Dude, you that. did it. You did it like about a few hours after Mobile World Congress was canceled. Right. And we knew, right. we knew Can was about to be canceled. Yep. And you're like, look, people need a platform to evolve the future of everything and to discuss all the shit that we need to like work on. Yep. And we need, like we depend on those gatherings to get that work done. And you're like, well, now we can't gather. So what can I create that can allow us to interact and move the conversation forward? And then you did it. Like it really took you like no time. I don't know. Yeah. So it wasn't, I did it. I had troops, right. only the troops were in the background. And now the troops are in the foreground. Gina, Mighty Networks is amazing. Tell me a little bit about it. Tell everybody who's listening a little bit about it because it is awesome. You are awesome. And the results, pretty awesome. Well, thank you for saying that. We, we really appreciate it. So, you know, Mighty Networks is a platform for people to be able to create their own community, online courses, digital business in one place under their brand, instantly available on every platform, iOS, Android and uh, both mobile and desktop web. So that's our vision of what we're doing. I mean, in, in a simple sentence, if anybody's familiar with what Shopify has done for e-commerce, we're looking to do that for subscriptions, memberships, and and obviously, you know, people coming together to learn and master something interesting together. So that's our vision. That's what we're really excited about. You know, we we just are super passionate about how people come together, how they build relationships with each other, and how they do that in a way that isn't just powerful virtually, but then, you know, really spills over into the real world as well. What's interesting to me is that every time someone said, well, you could build a better Facebook, I always laugh out loud and say, you know, take out your phone, open up your Facebook app and start scrolling. When I say stop, stop. Okay, what you just experienced at a remarkable rate of speed, 60 frames scrolling, was a custom feed based on everything you've ever done on Facebook since the beginning of time. And about a billion people can do that at once and they get a unique crafted experience. You can't build a better Facebook. You can't come close to building a better Facebook. Don't even, don't say it out loud again. You're a moron. You might be able to put together a community of people who are who have a, a passion, a shared passion, but you'll never beat their technology. And I actually believe that to the core of my, my being to this day and still do. What I found remarkable about Mighty Networks is that my thesis that the community of interest or the, the community of passion could be assembled and that the technology you needed wasn't didn't need to be at the scale and scope of Facebook. You needed to have the functionality of a community. You didn't need to mimic Facebook. And so you've done something really remarkable. You've given the best parts of Facebook uh, to, to me as a, a plug and play, literally something I can just do online without having much technical knowledge. And I have a lot of technical knowledge, but you don't need it. You've actually made it possible to create a community or craft a community I'm not going to say overnight, but in 36 hours? You know, fundamentally, we're really lucky. So, you know, I started um, Ning before Facebook was really a thing. Like, like, I started building social software 
before everybody had Facebook as the only paradigm of social media that existed. And what I learned from that experience was that the creator of the network was the customer. Like that was the person that if if we started with them and we actually looked at the member experience, not as they're our members, but they're the creator's members. And one of the multiple things we have to do is make them look awesome. And, you know, <laughs> sometimes we're, we're, you know, we're, we're better at that than other times and places. But if we can create a platform where that creator can really invest in creating something awesome. We certainly saw that at Ning and certainly now at Mighty Networks. That remains the driving North Star of what we're doing and how we're doing it, which is that like giving a creator the way to fully realize their vision for what is the best experience to offer people around an interest, a passion, a goal, something they need to learn, something they want to get better at or move from point A to point B. So that's really what motivates and drives us. But we definitely, you know, do not take at, uh, as, as, you know, some, you know, godlike being showed up on a mountaintop and said that the only way social media can be delivered is in the way that Facebook delivers it. It's simply not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question for you. So, you know, Shel Shelly's PGX is off to a very fast start, but they're definitely not your only success story at Mighty. So who else are you seeing grow great communities on the platform? Yeah. So, one of my favorite examples that I think is relevant here is um, what Peter Diamandis has done with something called Abundance Digital. And so Peter founded the X Prize and is just, you know, one of the most prolific, interesting dudes out there. And he started Abundance, I think it was like Abundance 360 as a conference, as a physical annual conference. Yep. And very quickly saw that. Well, this is a, you know, the, the, the power of this conference is in the people that we're connecting to each other. So he launched Abundance Digital to be sort of the 365 day extension, or I guess 364 day extension of the Abundance Conference. And it took off in ways that saw a lot of self organizing engagement. He has also. Uh, done some really interesting thing using our courses feature. So, so we have actually built online courses as a feature into a Mighty Network that a host or a creator can turn on or off. And so they've actually extended, you know, programming that they would have in sort of the physical space into an online course. And then they're connecting members to each other. And that's an area that we can't wait to get a lot, a lot more sophisticated with. Um, they have their own apps. They have over 2,000 people paying, you know, I think it's something like $14.95 per year. Um, so again, the, the, the price of a premium physical conference. And I think that this is going to become more and more relevant as, you know, as we are all navigating a new normal, which is what a virtual network effect gives you. So a virtual network that gets more valuable with every new person who joins is that it gives you time to meet people. It gives you time to see people's profiles. It gives you time to explore topics together in a way that that really alters and I would argue makes the physical conferences or the physical events even more powerful and valuable because it moves from being something that becomes about the serendipitous connections or like the people you happen to bump into or talk to at a party because they're talking to a friend of yours or somebody that you know to almost like a reunion because or, or a way to basically say, hey, we've already built a relationship, which means that when we're together in person, we're going to be able to just break through a lot of noise, get to the meat. And I think you guys already do this in a really special way, which is what makes what you guys have created so valuable. 
But I think as more people really discover what Peter's discovered, which is that the virtual makes the physical more valuable and that the virtual connections that people can make over time in a private or a paid network is something that really creates a level of magic that you know isn't happening in social media. It's, social media has other magic, but not this kind of magic. I think what's important, Gina, to to make clear is that the technology enables you to accomplish a goal, but you need to have the goal. The technology enables you to power your business, but you need a business objective. And so many people listening will think, wow, I can just sign on and it, I'm going to be able to do this. It's like, no, if you if you don't have a business objective clearly articulated, if you don't have uh, a plan that is requ- that requires this kind of empowerment to be executed, the actual, it's like buying a hammer does not get you a built house. It gets you a way to build the house. And so I don't want anyone to misunderstand or mishear. If you've got a business objective and a business goal and you believe that it would be enhanced by having a community of interest gather around you electronically and then the appropriate platforms to to extract and or to create value and then become remunerated from it, that's fine. But no one listening should think, wow, all I got to do is sign on the money networks. I'm going to build a social network and I'm going to make a fortune. Like, no, this isn't a get rich. Get- <laughs> oh, shit. I thought, I actually thought I could. No, and I, I, it's so important. I mean, I, I just, I didn't want any, because it's so easy to get caught up in technology and the mm-hmm. technology is not important here. It is. I mean, I don't mean to, you know, say that what you've built oh, no. isn't important, but the technology doesn't make this a it's business. A it's just a vehicle. That's right, Ross. That's the best way to right. say it. Right. And, and I think, I think that that's, That's absolutely true. The thing that I do, I I do want to reframe that a little bit though, Shelley, because when, when we really lay out for people, we call it community design. And, and we believe that it's actually, when when you just reframe it into, you know, the the business purpose, and and we even just think about it as what are people going to do together? What's the motivation for the community? So it's a little bit broader than business purpose alone. Um, and we, we call that your big purpose. Like, and it's a very simple, every marketer in the world has, you know, a variation of the sentence that says, you know, we bring together and who you bring together to what people are going to do together so that we can, and what are the amazing benefits or rewards that comes from doing that thing together. And when you have that, what, what I would say is everything gets easier, but to your point, if what you think you're going to do is basically create like a spot because people want to talk. Well, people have lots of other places to talk, which is one of the reasons why we really honed in on or honed in on on how do we help people who are one creators or conveners or curators of people bring people together to engage and to master something interesting together. One, because we think that's where the most interesting communities and the most interesting networks are going to continue to, sh- to, to show up from here. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if, if what people really want to do is just like mess around and like chit chat, um, there are so many other places to chit chat. That was not something that we thought was a particularly good use of our time. I think that's super important. It's a it's a really good point. And you what you've done is you've you've articulated that very clearly. It it also lands you in kind of um, an awkward spot. And we were just talking about this with Rachel Tipograph from Micmac. And it's that as we we witness the death of the old economy and the birth of a new one. Somehow you, you look like very prescient. You have created something that seems tailor made for our current reality. Uh, And because of it, as you said, because of this new reality, you and your business are thriving at a time when we watch hundreds of thousands of businesses fall apart right before our eyes. So how do you feel about that as a business leader? How do you feel about 
being one of the first to emerge um, in the midst of this crisis with a platform that's providing the utility and the space for others to continue their work uh, while while the economy is you know causing so many others to yeah suffer. so I, I don't view it as awkward um, I don't view it as you know we were already growing very rapidly before this um, this just you know the, the new normal has taken that to eleven um, and. What I would say is that there is, you know, the the reason we look like we're forward thinkers, you know, as you were saying that, I was like, you know, a broken clock's right twice a day. Um, But but it's because we had a very clear vision of what we wanted to do and that we knew that, or I would say believed very passionately that technology bends towards you know, people creating their their own websites, their own e-commerce stores, and now their own digital products and services platforms. So I, I just believe that that is the model um, and that it would happen either way. What I would say is I am I am very sensitive to the fact that we want to be a platform that helps people make this transition. And the reason I also don't think, and this is why I make the point earlier, made the point earlier, I do not believe that this is a blip. What I think that this is, is people understanding something we've said from the very beginning, which is that you actually can build your own network effect around a specific topic. You know, Facebook started in one college dorm. And they have created a network effect, but they had a network effect when it was one college. Um, we are unbundling that. Uh, and what what happens when you do that is that each and every creator has the opportunity to create a really successful business. What are you most excited about before we let you go back to your day? One thing that's really nice about right now is that we're growing really fast and that's awesome. Um, but everything else in the world feels sad right now. So it's hard for me to, um, it's hard for me to feel excited about things. I'm really looking forward to quickly delivering on a few things that, um, that Shelly would like that we are actually turned around and working on right now. Thank you. And yeah, of course. And, uh, and then we're doing, um, what we're essentially doing right now is the V3 of a lot of our kind of core features. So we just finished the V3 of our courses feature right before, um, you know, folks are staying at home. So that's been actually really exciting and cool. And then there's a few other areas in the product that we'll be doing the V3s of um, over the course of the spring and summer. So I'm really looking forward to that. So, you know, to, to finally be at a place in a platform where you can go, you know, especially for, for something that needs to bring together a, a, a lot of different pieces to really be the 10x value um, that, that we are today, you know, took time. Um, and now the fact that we can go back and continue to iterate and improve the things that are already there is really exciting. Well, we're psyched to have had you on the show. Thank you for coming on, Gina. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty inspiring what you're well, doing. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Now, now quickly go back to work and, and, and beat those people into the feature sets that we need at the Palmer Group. Very, very important for PGS. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Fantastic. So Ross, my mail is finally forwarded to where I am here in Vermont. And I was super excited because uh, I had learned that an old life insurance policy had been closed and there was a small cash value left. And I thought, wow, that's going to be a little fun pin money. And I'm going to give it to my granddaughters and it's going to be super fun. And I open up this envelope and lo and behold, what does it say? (laughs) We no longer have the money. The state has it. You have to go to the state's unclaimed funds dot gov did, did did you know such a thing even existed that's exactly right that is now a thing and if anyone's bored at home and you've you've done so much surfing of the internet that you've reached the end of the internet yes the- you've exhausted <laughs> you've exhausted the supply of netflix amazon hulu etc uh shout out to hbo max coming soon 
and you're like, what am I supposed to do with my time? Well, here's what you do. Go to the website of your state government and search up unclaimed property or unclaimed whatever, but it's there on every single state website. And it will ask you to enter your first name and your last name, and then it will serve up all of the addresses you lived in, and it'll tell you what, what they're holding for you. It could be money, it could be property, it could be whatever. But in the case of New York State, they're holding $16 billion in assets. And let me tell you something, I'm going to get mine. It's, it's amazing, by the way. And just safety tip, go to your state.gov website. Don't click on somebody else's like thing that's a service. Literally go directly <laughs> to the state's website and type it in the state's website's search box, unclaimed funds or unclaimed property, because there's plenty of charlatans out there, and neither Ross nor I are shilling for those guys. <laughs> so no. no but, but, but that said, Shelly, if you do suddenly uncover a, a, a treasure for yourself and your family. It's not so bad for you to send us a small percentage for letting you know about this. It's not so bad. Think about that. Great tips, gentlemen. In fact, my wife, like in many marriages, happens to be the brains of our family. And over the years, I lived like a nomad, before marriage, of course. And while I was wasting hours going to the end of the internet, as Ross would say, she was finding unclaimed money of mine in Maryland, Long Island, New York, and New Jersey. All I had to do was sign for it, and it was hers. So, print your name on your own stimulus check, folks. And then you can leave a positive rating and review at Apple Podcasts. Consider it our cut. Just a little thank you to Think About This with Shelley Palmer and Ross Martin. And if you think you know less than you did before, just wait until our next episode. 